On a recent daytime BBC TV panel, Brendan O'Neill, a well-known provocateur of dubious integrity, <clears throat> apparently went too far. The Supreme Court had just ruled that Boris Johnson's proroguing of par Parliament was illegal, and O'Neill thought that this was an outrage. He said, I just think the introduction of law into this process is an absolute disaster, because what, what, what it smacks of to me is that there's a layer of society so used to getting their own way in politics, so used to everything going their way over the past 30 or 40 years, who are repulsed by the fact that in 2016 it didn't go their way. And now they'll use their financial power, their legal power, and their parliamentary power to make sure it doesn't happen again. And I'm amazed that there hasn't been riots yet. And the BBC presenter, Adam Fleming, asked if he thought there will be riots. And Brendan O'Neill said, I think there should be. And this, by all accounts, was beyond the pale. There was outrage both on the panel and beyond, and he was accused of inciting violence, encouraging insurrection, and so on. Now, O'Neill is a blowhard and an idiot. And one of those commentators who delights in being otherwise and who courts attention by wrapping offensive and inflammatory and reactionary interventions into the cloak of being a contrarian. He has in the past derided the teenage climate change activist Greta Thunberg, who has autism, as being a millenni millenni millenarian weirdo, suggested that Jimmy Savile's victims keep their abuse to themselves and castigated efforts to combat racism in football as class war, as well as opposing same-sex marriage in Australia. Indeed, given such a record, one has to assume that the BBC invited him on to spice things up, precisely in the knowledge that he would say something incendiary. But somehow this was too much. Now, my intention here isn't to defend him. I think he's odious. Um, and his remark in this context is ridiculous because the ruling in question actually enabled democracy, it didn't short circuit it. But the reason I raise it in the centenary of 1919 is because it illustrates the degree to which, even in this moment, the word riot gets people frothing at the mouth. Just to mention or evoke them can provoke such ire and consternation. Now, you might think that's because it suggests violence. But given on the fact that on that very show they've quite calmly discussed whether and when to launch wars, it can't be just about violence. You might think it's about promoting social unrest, but if you see the mainstream coverage of Hong Kong or Venezuela, the collapse of the Berlin Wall or the Gilets Jaunes in France, it's clearly not that. So what is it? Well, tonight, I want to talk about what we mean when we talk about riots, where they come from, why they can be so willfully misrepresented and misunderstood, and the, how the very idea of them poses a challenge to establishment. And I want to start with the last element first, because on this anniversary more than most, it would help to inject some clarity into the discussion. The one thing that I think all riots have in common, or the main thing they have in common, is not that they are violent. It's that that violence is exercised independently of the state and takes place on a mass or, at the very least, group scale and usually in an unstructured manner. We're used to the state having monopoly on violence, the police, the army, the security services. We are used to the idea that they are allowed to beat and maim and kill and batter and threaten and imprison and force. Now, I wouldn't say that we're all comfortable with this, particularly given the disproportionality with which some communities are on the rough end of this violence. That can be extremely disconcerting, but we are familiar with it. And that's why it's so important that we democratise police forces, security services and so on, so that they are accountable. But what riots have in common is that the lock of the state, that the state has on violence becomes broken. The question about who should be battered, maimed, or killed, by whom, why, and to what end, become open. No uniform permit or code is necessary. It may be an assault on people. It may be an assault on property. It's usually both. Now, that doesn't mean the violence is indiscriminate. However crudely stated or incoherent, 
riots express political, not social violence. And to that extent, this is what they have in common is, um, well, this is what they have in common, they are ideologically agnostic. At times, though, the violence is, um, though the violence is advanced independently of the state, it may have the sanction of the state. And even the state's um, uh, helping the state work more effectively than the state itself. There are even things called police riots. When the state decides that its monopoly on violence isn't enough, and they run amok, using the power at their disposal in a willful, unstructured, and unlawful manner to suppress protest. I saw that firsthand in America in Ferguson, following the shooting of Michael Brown. Conversely, riots can be, and often are, directed against the state. The riots of 81 across Britain and to a lesser extent 2011 were violent protests against police uh, brutality and repression, the sus laws, uh, and people feeling that in certain communities they lived in a state of occupation. Now, because violence stands at the center of what a riot might be, there are other things that go with it, regardless of its target. There's looting, which should not be mistaken for shoplifting. There is targeting a certain, eth targeting a certain ethnic group isn't the same as a barroom brawl. Taking on the police for the control of the streets is not the same as merely resisting arrest. When a group of people join forces to flout both law and social convention, they are acting politically. Insisting on their criminality, as they often do, and um, just last night there are a series of um, riots taking place in Ecuador at the moment. And I saw the, um, the, the president, and it came straight from the play, but these are criminals, uh, these are criminals who want social unrest and, and so on. Insisting on the criminality of those involved as though that alone explains their motivations is, and the context is irrelevant, is fatuous. To stress their criminality doesn't deny the political nature of what takes place. It simply chooses to only partially describe it. But because violence lies at the center of what a riot can be or is, there are some attributes that will be common to them all. Like most violence, they tend towards the hypermasculine. Not exclusively, but predominantly. That doesn't women ha that mean that women have no role in the process, but they're unlikely to be equally involved in it and may be completely marginalized from it. And the second is that they tend to be polarizing. You can't argue with a brick or a bottle or a Molotov cocktail or a fist. You can't split the difference. The fence on which a liberal might sit when a riot takes place is generally the first casualty. People are marshaled into crude camps. Your sympathies are drawn to either those on the giving or the receiving end. And in all of these respects, riots, regardless of their target or political orientation, are indeed a class act. Wealthy people don't need to riot. They have the levers of the state at their disposal to defend their person and property. Lawyers that they might call on to mediate disputes, a media to frame their interests, their interests as a common interest. And if all else fails, private security that can be employed to do their dirty work and heavy lifting for them. But the fact that working class people are the protagonists doesn't mean that the riots themselves are in the interests of the working class. Which brings us neatly to the riots in Liverpool in 1919. Now when Madeleine invited me here, um, she was trying to make it easy on me, uh, but I said, you know, I can't come to Liverpool and tell people about the riots because I don't really know about them. And um, I'd, I'd, I'd feel silly and um, I'd be out of my depth um, I should, if, you know, I should be in the audience. Um, and so I'm sure there are people better equipped to talk specifically about the riots, but for those who don't know, I'm just gonna run through what took place, which is on June the 4th, a West Indian man, John Johnson, was stabbed in the face by two Scandinavians in a pub after he refused to give them a cigarette. 
The next night, eight of his friends went to the pub seeking redress. They threw beer on the Scandinavians and attacked them and sent five to the hospital, though only one was seriously injured. And when a policeman tried to stop them, they knocked him unconscious. The police then raided boarding houses used by black seamen who defended themselves as best they could. One policeman was shot in the mouth, another in the neck, a third was slashed in the face, and a fourth had his wrist broken. At one boarding house, Charles Wooden, a 24-year-old ship's fireman from Bermuda, ran. Two policemen and an angry mob gave chase. Wooden was caught by the dock. The mob took over, throwing him in the water and pelting him with rocks. He was stoned to death and then dragged out. No arrests were made. For the next few days, it was open season on black men in the city. Every black man was fair game. Gangs of thousands of white men roamed the city in pursuit of their prey. And as, we, as we've seen, black men defended themselves, but they were no match for the mob. On June the 8th, three West Africans were stabbed in the street. Houses where black people lived were looted and torched. And it was the black men who were then imprisoned in subsequent arrests. At this point, the terminology becomes important. 1919 was called a race riot, and insofar as it was a riot that involved different races in combat, then it was. But then 1981, when mostly black youth challenged the uh, police in Toxford, that was also called a race riot. In, and insofar as it was a riot <clears throat> that centered around issues of race, it was too. But they weren't even remotely similar in their political character, outcome, or origins. 1919, it would be closer to say, and this doesn't mean it wasn't a riot, was closer to a pogrom, an escalation of violent incidents aimed at the massacre or persecution of an ethnic or religious group. Its term is generally related to Jewish persecution, but there's no reason why it wouldn't apply here. Indeed, it was a pogrom in which the police colluded, encouraging a state of lawlessness in the persecution of a group and in turn being supported in their repression. 1981 was an uprising, and they are the same as riots in the same way that apples and oranges are both fruit. They're different, but they belong to the same category. But no one could or should mistake one for the other. Now, those events in 1919 would, at first sight, appear spontaneous. If only Johnson had given those Scandinavian men that cigarette. If only they hadn't drunk so much, it may never have happened. What ensued afterwards relates to a set of events that could not have been prevented. In her book, Ghetto Side, about the investigation of a single murder in LA, Jill Leovi describes the incidents that produce murders as being remarkably similar. The killings, she writes, typically arise from arguments. A large share of them can be described in two words men fighting. The fights might be spontaneous, part of some long-running feud, or the culmination of some drama. And when riots do occur, enterprising journalists often seek to uncover the precipitating incident, the thing that set it off. Now, that thing which they seek is often telling. The attack on Jack Johnson does say a great deal about how things will pan out over the next few days, just as the heavy-handed police apprehension of Leroy Alphonse Cooper in 1981 set the scene for what would come next. But to reduce these or any riots to individual moments that just get out of hand, escalating as passions are inflamed, misunderstands history as a series of isolated incidents, either discrete or independent from each other, producing at times an uncanny set of coincidences. Four months earlier in February of that year, in South Shields on the Tyne, there'd been a pitch battles, there'd been pitch battles between Arabs and white workers after the latter attacked the former. These scuffles, which ended in 17 Arab men being arrested, of whom three were acquitted, 12 sentenced to three months and two to one month hard labor. Just a day after Charles Wooten was murdered, 
A fight broke out in Newport in Wales after a black man was alleged to have made an offensive remark to a white woman. Once again, black homes were ransacked and black men were arrested en masse. A few days later, in the village of Caddockston, southwest of Cardiff, a demobilized white soldier, Frederick Henry Longman, attacked a black seaman from the French West Indies. Charles Emmanuel, Emmanuel fought back, fatally stabbing Longman. A mob gathered, Emmanuel was apprehended. Eight miles away in Cardiff, <clears throat> a large and angry crowd gathered to greet a group of black men and their white wives as they returned from an excursion. A familiar spate of arson, intimidation, police and police collaboration followed. This was before Twitter. In a period where news spread relatively slowly and many of those involved couldn't read. Of course, there would have been some news of Liverpool that could have spread by this time. But there are only so many isolated incidents we can really talk about before we have to accept that there's a pattern. And if you pull the lens back for a moment, you can take a look over the Atlantic. For in the week before Liverpool had its riot in 1919, there were confrontations in Eatonton, Georgia, after a black man refused, was refused a bottle of soda, and in Milledgeville, after the white and black schools chose the same colours for their teens. At least six black churches and other community centres um, were torched. And in the US, they called this the Red Summer, with more than 40 towns, most markedly Chicago and DC, embroiled in racist violence and large numbers of people uh, uh, being killed and injured. Now, if we understand history as a series of processes rather than a listing of events, we can start to connect the dots. In that sense, it reminds me a lot of the riots in Britain in August 2011. Five months earlier, I'd been in Spain, where the jobless rate among 16 to 19-year-olds was 43%. I asked one of the country's most popular bloggers, Ignacio Escolar, why there'd been no revolt of any kind. And he said, it's like there's oil on the streets. All it needs is a small spark and it could blow. Now that sounded like the kind of wishful thinking that a former Trotskyist, that's me, would put at the end of a piece. But within a few months, the indignados, the indignant ones, were occupying squares all over Spain. A few years after that, they would form a political party, Podemos, that would challenge the established Socialist Party. But in August of that year, when the British riots occurred, the media and political classes quickly came to the consensus that thousands of young people were gripped in a fit of collective pathology. They'd taken to the streets, breaking into shops, stealing and confronting the police. And they had no idea what triggered it, but whatever it was, it wasn't politics. It wasn't poverty, it wasn't alienation, or an undereducated, under, it was, uh, or despair. The riots were not the work of disaffected teenagers, but, and I quote, a feral, uneducated, uneducated underclass who somehow, despite being uneducated, managed to outwit the police for the best part of a week <laughs> using new technology. They were venal, entitled, and irresponsible, and they adhered to values entirely unfamiliar to the British establishment. It was not immediately obvious to me, anyway, precisely what these conflagrations were about. I knew that it wasn't that, but I didn't know what they were about. And at the time, I wrote, beyond Tottenham, which is where Mark Duggan had been shot and where the original protests had taken place, those who took to the streets last week failed to advance any cause, embrace any ideal, or articulate any agenda. And this places them firmly in the context of a weak and ineffectual left that has failed to reinvent and reinvigorate itself in the face of a deep economic crisis. It marks a generational failure. In the absence of any community leadership, viable social movements, or memory of collective struggle, the most these political orphans could hope to achieve was private acquisition and social chaos. Now, I don't think that was a ridiculous first take. It wasn't completely wrong, but it was wrong enough. 
they were far more politically aware than most I had interviewed on the left had fathomed at the time. In research conducted later by The Guardian and the London School of Economics with those who'd been involved in the riots, we learned that many, including those who live outside London, knew of the shooting of Mark Duggan, and 75% cited it as an important or very important cause of the riots. They were also considerably more likely than the public at large to say poverty, inequality, government policy, and policing were behind the riots. The cause they most often cited for rioting was poverty, unemployment, and inequality. But the tinder in the box that was lit as much by the long, long arm of the law as by the invisible hand of the market. Almost three quarters of the interviewees said they had been stopped and searched by the police in the last year. 85% said policing was an important or very important cause of the riots. Just 7% believed the police did a good job in their area. But in all the interviews, the apparently mutual contempt between rioters and police comes through. Tales of petty harassment, abuse, and humiliation were commonplace. That was here. But if you just pull the lens back a little bit, what you see is a year, 2011, that starts with uprisings in Tunisia and ends with police raids on Occupy Wall Street and the encampments that had popped up all around the globe. And so when I got a second take, a year after the riots, when we had conducted that research, I said only a naive would understand these disturbances as a random, isolated moment of mass social deviancy, particular to Britain. It would be like claiming that the two black athletes who raised their fists on the podium during the Mexico Olympics in 68 engaged in individual acts of protest in no way related to the students in Paris, the massacre in My Lai, or the passing of the US Civil Rights Act. When the Tories, with Lib Dem assistance, launched their austerity plans, warnings came from the new head of the IMF, the police, the ratings agency Moody's, and the UN's International Labour Organization that the result could be social unrest. Nick Clegg himself predicted it. He said in the run up to the election in 2010, imagine the Conservatives get an absolute majority on 25% of the eligible votes and then turn around in the next week or two and say we're gonna chuck up the 80 to 20%. We're gonna start cutting teachers, cutting police and the wage bill in the public sector. I think if you're not careful in that situation, you get Greek-style unrest. The Tories got 23% of the eligible vote, despite not winning an absolute majority, and it all happened anyway, and Nick Clegg helped. The 2011 riots would probably win gold as the year's most destructive, least coherent protest of disaffected youth against indifferent elites economic hardship and police brutality. Riots, rioters were more likely to give the finger than clench the fist. But what the report makes clear is that they belong in the same category of protest. All of which is to say that another feature of riots is that they are always about something, despite the fact that those in power will claim that they are about nothing but criminality. And they're all about something more than whatever the precipitating issue might be. And when we come back to 1919, we have to start with the war that ended just a year before. War changes people and societies. And when they're over, the genies quite often won't go back in the bottle. Countries needed labor. Britain drew on the empire. America drew on the south. Liverpool's black population grew considerably during the war as blacks, and after the war as black servicemen were demobilized and seafarers discharged. Similarly, Cardiff's black population increased from about 700 just before the war to about 3,000 in April 1919. In the US, where there were more black people, the confrontations went on for longer, there was more loss of life and there's more documentation. President Woodrow Wilson said in a private conversation that March, 
The American Negro returning from abroad will be our greatest medium in conveying Bolshevism to America. Beyond race, we should also realize or recall that the Russian Revolution had happened just two years before, and that an attempted revolution in Germany had just been quashed earlier that year in 1919. One black veteran in the US wrote a letter to the editor of the Chicago Daily News saying the returning black veterans are now new men and world men, if you please, and their possibilities for direction, guidance, honest use and power are limitless, only they must be instructed and led. They have awakened, but they have not yet the complete conception of what they have awakened to. War will do that to people. In his Vietnam War novel, The Things They Carried, Tim O'Brien said, if you don't care for obscenity, if you don't care for the truth, and if you don't care for the truth, watch how you vote, because when you send guys to war, they come home talking dirty. Those labor shortages that these people have been recruited to fill were no more. Demobilized white workers resented the competition which came in black face. Not heeding trade unions, not heeding Marx's warning that labor in the white skin can never free itself as long as labor in the black skin is branded, opted for racism over solidarity. The scene was set for a disgruntled white working class to take their emboldened uh, to take on their emboldened black counterparts. That was the oil that flooded the streets in Liverpool and beyond in 1919. There is always a context. There is always a cause. Riots strike fear into the establishment because they invariably expose and sometimes expand existing structural crises and fault lines within the polity and the broader society. Are they ever justified? Well, sometimes I think they are. Not in 1919, but in 1981 and 2011, I think there is a case, at least. People have a right to resist occupation, oppression, penury, and marginalization, even if we don't necessarily agree with every method that they use to do so. And those who ask, rightly, what could violent protest possibly achieve must at the very less question the nature of the peace that exists already. In 1966, when Martin Luther King started to campaign against segregation in Chicago, only to find his efforts thwarted by violent white mobs and a scheming mayor, he could feel that nonviolence, both as a strategy and as a principle, was eroding amongst his supporters. He wrote, I need some help in getting this method across. A lot of people have lost faith in the establishment. They've lost faith in the democratic process. They've lost faith in nonviolence. Those who make this peaceful revolution impossible will make a violent revolution inevitable. And we've got to get this over. I need help. I need some victories. I need concessions. But while I believe that rioting can at times be justified, and this is where I have a problem with what O'Neill was doing. I think it should never be fetishized. Ultimately, it's a sign, not of strength, but weakness. The crudest tool for those who have the fewest options. By definition, riots are chaotic. They raise awareness of problems they cannot in themselves solve. King said a riot is the language of the old unheard, and that's as actually true for the white mob as it is for those protesting police oppression. We don't always need to like what people have to say, but we have to hear it. Sometimes it's not simply the most effective way of being heard, but the only way. After the 67 riots in American cities, President Johnson set up the Kerner Commission, and it concluded what, might, what white Americans have never fully understood, but what the Negro can never forget, is that white society is deeply implicated in the ghetto. White institutions created it, white institutions maintain it, and white society condones it. How else was such a damning indictment of discrimination in the US ever gonna land on the president's desk, if not 
after a riot. Following the inner city uprisings across Britain in, 91, in 81, Lord Scarman argued that urgent action was needed to prevent racial disadvantage becoming an endemic, ineradicable disease threatening the very survival of our society. It wasn't a great report, and yet, how else would you get a Lord to come to that conclusion? A few years later, Michael Heseltine wrote a report into the disturbances in Toxteth. Its title, It Takes a Riot. <laughs> 